I don't know if you've ever been involved in this. Maybe you've seen somebody, a Christian, devoted to their faith, passionate about reaching people for Jesus Christ. Maybe they're going door to door telling people about their relationship with Jesus Christ. Maybe you've seen them out on a street. Maybe then it's been an affair. And it seems that these people have so much passion that they want to tell people what the Bible says, that they want to communicate God's word to them. I've seen this before where people have been so passionate and yet they haven't been equipped with the knowledge of what they believe about the Bible. And so they have all this passion, but the second that they're asked a question or the second that somebody pushes back, they don't know how to respond. I think one of the greatest problems facing the Christian church today is that we have a lot of people with passion and zeal, but that they don't have a lot of knowledge about what they believe and why they believe it. I believe that in order for us to be effective with the gospel, we have to have that passion, we need to have that zeal, but we also have to have the conviction based on knowledge, based on information, on why we believe what we believe. You think about the core tenets of the Christian faith, we develop those as Christians from what we believe the Bible teaches is true. And so many times when you're having a conversation with somebody about sin and salvation, about Jesus and about his relationship to mankind, many people, many Christians will respond by saying, what does the Bible teach? I know I was a Bible teacher for 13 years and I was always trying to drive my students back to the question of what does the Bible teach? I know what you think, I know what you believe, I know what you would like for it to say, but I have to ask the question, what does the Bible actually teach? The other day I was in a discussion with a former student. We were talking about social issues and how we came to conclusions about morality, about what was right and what was wrong. And one of the things that I was continuing trying to remind myself, but also to remind my former student was we have to put ourselves into submission to scripture. But one of the things I think that is interesting about putting ourselves into submission to scripture or by telling other people about what the Bible teaches is we have to be informed about what the Bible is and why it's trustworthy. And so for the next few video series, I wanna walk us through this idea of what the Bible is. Part one, we're just gonna kind of talk about what the Bible is, how it was composed, how it was put together, what we can kind of expect from it. Part two, I wanna ask the question, how do we get the Bible? We know that the Bible didn't just drop out of the sky, but how did we get from the story and the work of Jesus Christ to present day where we have the Bible translated in a variety of language. And finally, part three, I wanna ask the question, can we actually trust the Bible? This book that's been dated 2000 years ago, is it still reliable today? Is it something that we can still trust? This morning, I wanna ask the question of what is the Bible? So let me just start out by giving you just some general information, some stuff that we should know. Maybe I would say Bible 101. I believe that this is the greatest story ever told. I mean, we see in the beginning with Adam and Eve and creation and God creates mankind and Adam is given the responsibility of naming. And it says that God created the heavens and the earth and that God created the animals and God created the sea and God created the land and God created uh, Adam and Eve and all of mankind. And so we see this great story, but early on in this story, we see this fall between God and man. We see this in Genesis chapter three where Adam and Eve actually rebel against the will of God and because of that, they suffer the consequences. And for thousands of years, there's this rejection, there's this rebellion, and yet, and the person and the work of Jesus Christ comes, we see this great redemption of mankind. And yet, today, we hope for the glory. I call this the great meta narrative creation, fall, redemption, and glory. And this is what the Bible tells us. I believe it's one of the most unique books ever written. It's been printed more times than any other book in history. Interesting enough, at Barnes and Noble, it's the number one most stolen book. Think about that for a second, a little bit ironic. It has been translated into more languages than any other book. About 98% of the world's languages have the Bible translated in some form or fashion. Many linguists believe that within the next 50 years, we should have the entire Bible translated into every single known language. This book has had profound influence on the way that people think for over 2,000 years. It shaped society, it shaped culture, it shaped inventions, it shaped mankind. It's had a profound influence, and yet we still have to ask the question, how do we know that it's true? How do we know that this book can be reliable and trustworthy? If you were talking to someone about the makeup or the genetic of the book, we would basically tell them it's a, a book of stories about how God relates to mankind. In this story, we find out how we should relate, how we should act to have a best relationship, not only with God, but with others. We find out how God relates to us 
And ultimately, we see the story of Jesus Christ who came to redeem all of us. The Bible is made up of 66 books. There are 39 in the Old Testament, all the way from Genesis to the book of Malachi. We see in the New Testament there are 27 books, starting with the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and ending with the book of Revelation. In the book of Acts, we see a, basically a historical look from 30 to 70 A.D. Now, when we talk about this, there were 40 different authors that wrote the book. Some were rich, some were poor, some were educated, some weren't very educated. And yet the Bible never seems to contradict itself. I think this speaks to the awesome power of God working through this. When we talk about the New Testament, I want to focus just in on this for the next couple of sections, just talking about the New Testament and especially the work of Jesus Christ. When we talk about the New Testament, it was the first book was James. That was probably the first book written. It was somewhere around 46 AD. Now, just to kind of give you a context for where this is at, Jesus was probably born somewhere around 4 or 5 BC. He died somewhere around the age of 33. So that's putting us somewhere around 27 AD. And yet we see within about 20 years, the authors start to write this down. James writes his first letter in 46 AD. We believe in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that Mark was probably the first one written. We have a lot of historical evidence that would support that. Matthew, which actually looks a lot like Mark, if you looked at it from an outline perspective, he just goes into a few more details. Mark probably wrote first. Matthew probably used his and then added something to that. And then we believe that Luke, had reference to Matthew and Mark, and he was able to write his gospel from his perspective, giving that. Now, why is this significant? Well, here's why it's significant. Luke, who would later on go on and write the book of Acts, and he says that it's a follow-up, a compendium to the book of Luke. We know that the book of Acts was actually written before 70 AD. In 70 AD, the Jewish temple was destroyed. This was probably the most devastating thing to the Jewish community. People to this day, we're still talking about the destruction of Solomon's temple. It was a grievous time in Jewish history, and yet we don't see any mention of that in the book of Acts, which leads us to assume that the book of Acts must have been written before 70 AD. I, I use this example with my students. Imagine that if you were to pick up a U.S. history textbook, and as you were looking through it, you wanted to see what they reported on the events of September 11, 2001. And you look through the entire book and at no point do you find anything. So you go to the index and you look through there, 9-11, New York City, and you can't find anything. Well, the most natural assumption would be this book must have been written before September 11, 2001. Because this event was, had such an impact on U.S. history that it would be involved in a textbook. And if it wasn't, we have to assume that the textbook must have written before that. And we believe that the last book is probably the book of Revelation. It was probably written somewhere around 90 AD. Some people have asked the question, well, why wasn't the New Testament written earlier? I mean, if Jesus died in 27 AD, why does James write till 46 AD? Why did the gospel writers wait till 50 and 60 AD? And why does John finish it off in the book of Revelation and wait until 90 AD? But many times I remind people that this is actually a very bad question. Really, the best question is why would they write it anyway? Less than 10% of the people in the first century could actually read and write. So really by writing down the gospels, it really didn't help anybody except for the 10%. But there are a few reasons that the gospel writers felt compelled to write down these stories and to compose the New Testament. I'm going to give you three of them here real quick. The first one is they had to refute heresy. There were a lot of people who were teaching things that were uh, against the gospel, that they were against what we believe that God's word teaches. And so the New Testament writers believed that they had to put forth some type of teaching that would refute heresy. One of the main guys was a guy by the name of Marcion who had some very heretical ideas and so the Bible had to compose so that they could refute those ideas. You couldn't just say that that's not true. You had to have some type of source. And that's where we see the New Testament authors being motivated and inspired to do that. Another reason is the gospel just continued to spread forth. When Jesus dies, he probably didn't travel more than 100 miles. He never held office. He rarely spoke in public. Most of the time he just spent with his disciples. And yet, this changes the known world. Now, in a square footage of 100 miles, you can travel back and forth, but when you start talking about the known world, 
it was much easier to send a document than to actually go from Asia Minor to China to, to, to the Europeans to North Africa. It would be very challenging for them to do that and so it became very necessary for them to write these things down. And then finally, it's just obvious that the disciples were dying off. They needed to catalog what they had been uh, taught. They had to catalog what they had seen, their testimonies of what God was doing. And so we see that because of heresy, because of the gospel spreading, because of the disciples, we see the comp composition of the New Testament. Let me just close with this today as we talk about what does the Bible actually claim to be? Well, throughout the Bible, you'll see this idea of that it's the inspiration, that it's the words of God. Over 4,000 times the Bible claims to be the word of God. We see this in the Old Testament where it says, thus saith the Lord. We see this in the New Testament where Paul many times says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. We see over 4,000 times that it claims to be the word of God. So either this is the word of God or it's a book that lies to us 4,000 times. The Bible claims to be inspired. We see this in the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verse 16 through 17. Let me read this first to you real quick. It says, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And I want to focus in on this verse here, but I really want to focus in on one word. It's the word God breathed. In the Greek, that means thea nuetos. And what the New Testament author Paul was trying to express here to a young Timothy was to say that these are not my words, but these are literally the words of God, theo nuesto, that these are God's words being breathed out. And so if you were to challenge me, you're not challenging me, Paul the apostle, you're challenging the words of God. We believe that the New Testament authors were divinely inspired and that, that the Bible was written in dual authorship. And what we mean by dual authorship is not that the Bible was written by man and not that the Bible was written by God, but that the Bible was written by both man and God. And so we see God speaking through the New Testament authors, but they use their own personalities, they use their own language. And so, for example, when you read the book of Matthew, Matthew is a tax collector, and so Matthew uses language that a tax collector would normally use. Luke, who is a physician, uses medical terms that many medical people would have used in that time period. We see Peter, who doesn't seem to be as schooled, he's a fisherman, and so his Greek is a lot more, um, it's less grammatical, than the Greek that Paul would use because Paul was school and Paul was trained to do that. And so we see God using this, and yet of all the New Testament authors, we never see any contradiction. Paul writes probably 12 New Testament books, and we see just the impact he had. We see uh, Luke, who writes Luke and Acts, John, who writes John and uh, Revelation. And so there's some major authorship in the New Testament, and yet it never contradicts itself. Because we believe these are the words of God, it would naturally follow that we would believe in inerrancy. That's the teaching that the Bible does not have errors because God cannot err. And because these are the words of God, there can be no errors in that. Now, one thing I want to close with, when we talk about inspiration and when we talk about inerrancy, we're talking about the original documents. We're not talking about our copies today. This Bible right here has mistakes in it because the copies that it was made from had mistakes. We believe that inspiration and inerrancy only applies to the original documents, the original book of Matthew, the original book of John, the original book of Acts. Those are inspired, those are inerrant. Now, next week we'll talk about how do we know that the Bible is trustworthy, being put together, and being reliable. I hope this helps. Have a great conversation.